Let's go ahead and get into the Word of God this morning. And again, I am really excited that you all are here this morning for Easter morning. I'd like us to go to John chapter number 14 this morning. John chapter number 14. I was studying through the Gospels, looking at the, uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, resurrection passages. I, I thought it was interesting. I, I don't know that I had noticed this before. But a large section of the book of John takes place in the Passion Week. Uh, in fact, I think it's oh, around the middle of chapter number 12, all the way up to around chapter number 20 or 21, that is all just within that Passion Week, just from the time of the triumphal entry to the death of of Christ and then the resurrection. And so just that little week, John records a whole lot about the life of Christ. And, uh, you know, he is the one at the end of the book of John who says, you know, if, if everything were recorded, then he didn't suppose that all the books could contain all the things that were said and done by the Lord Jesus. And certainly uh, we can understand how that could be if he could fill up that many chapters of the book of John just for that one week. And that wasn't everything that happened in that week either. But uh, in John chapter number 14, this is something that the Lord Jesus speaks to his disciples right as he's preparing to go to the cross. And uh, I want to just take a little bit of a focus on it this morning, thinking about both the, the cross and the resurrection. We'll touch on those some this morning. But I want to talk to you about really the whole purpose, why Jesus came, why he came and died, why he rose from the dead, what was the intent of it all. And uh, I'm going to do it in a way that asks and answers this question. Do you know the way to heaven? Do you know the way to heaven? Now, if I were to ask some of you if you knew the way to the nearest Starbucks, I imagine some of you could give me some clear instructions and directions. Um, some of you are like, who in the world pays $6 for a cup of coffee? And I, I can relate to that, but you know, I don't drink a lot of coffee. My wife likes Starbucks, so sometimes we go to Starbucks somewhat often. Some of you might um, be a little more athletic than I am or work out a little bit more, and if I were to ask you, do you know the, the, the way to the nearest gym? You might be like, yeah, I can get you to the nearest gym nearby here. Um, some of you may not be coffee drinkers or athletic, but you might at least know the, the way to get to the nearest Chick-fil-A. And uh, we stopped through Chick-fil-A yesterday. Now, my, I have a love-hate relationship with Chick-fil-A because I like their food, but man, it's just kind of expensive. But everything is expensive these days, so I don't know what to do about that. But, you know, you might know the way to that, or here in California, you might know the way to the nearest In-N-Out Burger. Um, you might even, if you're, if you're like our family, we love dogs. We've got a couple of dogs, right? We just finished having a litter of puppies and we're getting those sold back home. But um, you might can tell me the way to the nearest dog park. I know that a lot of times there aren't even that many yards for the, your dogs to play in, so you take them to the dog park. Or some of you are readers, you could probably tell me the way to get to the nearest library. My boys, even though we travel all around the country, my wife likes to find libraries that we can stop in at and, and get books for our boys to read. Um, maybe even after the service this morning, you could tell me the way to get to the, the best restaurant around. But the main question again this morning is, do you know the way to heaven? Now, a lot of people have answers. I imagine if I ask you, do you know the way to heaven, then something immediately is going to come to your mind. I've asked a number of people, do you know for sure if you die tonight, you go to heaven? And uh, I, I tell you what, a lot of people say, you know, I think I would, or, or yeah, I'd go to heaven. And if I were to ask them, how do you know that you're going to heaven, then I'd get a lot of different answers. But uh, Jesus is in this passage speaking to his disciples. And you know, his disciples have been traveling with him for, for three years plus now. And his disciples had heard him say a lot of things, right? And this is the passion of Jesus about to die on the cross. He's about to raise from the grave three days after that. And he's already been talking to them about these things. And as he's preparing them for these things, he says in verse number one, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Now, 
Jesus actually doesn't sound like had to go to actually make the mansions. Those, he said, they're already there. What's the preparation he's going to have to go make for them very soon? It's at the cross. That's the preparation the Lord is about to make. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. The only way any of us could get to heaven in those mansions was that Jesus prepared the way by dying on the cross and rising from the grave. So he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Now again, his disciples have been traveling with him for these years. He said a lot of things to them. We'll look at some of those in a moment. But even after all the things that his disciples had said, as religious as they had become, as much as they believed in their master, the Lord Jesus Christ, yet notice their response. He had said, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. What was the place he was talking about? If he's going to be with his father to the place of many mansions, what was that place he was talking about? He's talking about going to heaven, going to the abode of God, which is heaven. And what is the Thomas says? Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. And how can we know the way? Mm-hmm. You know, the fact is, it's very possible and even easy to be religious, to have studied, and to not actually know the way to heaven. People have spent a lot of time in the Word of God, spending time with God, in prayer and other things, and yet really don't know the way to heaven. These disciples, all that time they'd spent hearing all that preaching from Jesus, and yet they didn't know where he was going. And they said, how can we know the way? And Jesus answered. He said, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus gave the answer I am the way. According to the Bible, there's only one way to heaven, and it's Jesus. You know, you ask a lot of people, do you know the way to heaven? And they'll say, yes, the way to heaven is by getting baptized. You've got to get baptized. But Jesus said, I am the way. Not baptism. He said, I am the way. I spoke to a man yesterday who was uh, telling me how he'd been baptized and sharing that as his testimony of salvation. That's not what Jesus said. Baptism is a good thing, but it's not what's going to save you. Only faith alone in Jesus Christ alone can save you. Jesus is the only way. Some people would say, well, yeah, it's being a good person. If you do enough good works and your good works outweigh your bad, that'll get you to heaven. But that's not the Bible way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's only through Jesus. Faith alone in Christ alone. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, So by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. A lot of people trying to work their way to heaven. Trying to do enough good works to outweigh their bad. And the problem is, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but the problem is our sin. Our sin is what breaks our fellowship with God. And it is the thing that hinders us from being able to get to heaven regardless of how many good works we do. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about being born again. It's talking about spiritual birth. Jesus said, except man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And there has to be a spiritual birth. A time each one of us puts our faith in Jesus Christ alone. He's the only way. Well, Jesus is the way to heaven. The disciples, they were religious. But they didn't fully understand yet. There may be some here today that you've been religious, but maybe you just haven't fully understood from the Word of God what is the way to heaven. And I'm here to tell you today, according to the Word of God, the only way to heaven is Jesus. Now, listen to some of the things that Jesus had already said in the presence of his disciples. In John 6, verse number 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He also said in John 8, verse number 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know what Jesus is saying in each one of these passages? 
He's saying, I'm the only way. I'm the bread. I am the light. You know what else he said? In verse number 9 of chapter number 10, Jesus said, I am the door. If any man, by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the door. Listen, if you and I could get to heaven any other way, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. But he is the only door into heaven. He is the door. And he says, if we come in by him, we'll go in and out and find pasture. Jesus also said in a couple of verses later in John 10, he said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus had come for. He came for one purpose, one intent, one desire, one goal. He knew why he had come. If you read through the gospel accounts and you read through even the, the days leading up to his death, you'll find over and over again, he says, the days are coming, I'm going to be crucified. He understood that the Son of Man was come to seek and to save that which was lost. He knew that he'd come to save you and I from our sins. And so he was the good shepherd, but not only that, he said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. That's what we're here to celebrate today, Jesus Christ's resurrection. And ultimately, the only way you and I can have promise and hope of eternal life is because of and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If he had not been raised, even in the passage that we read this morning a little bit earlier, uh, if, we had, if he had not been raised from the dead, were it not for his resurrection, we could have no hope of resurrection ourselves. But because he did rise from the dead, we also have promise that one day we will spend eternity for, with him. We can also rise from the dead. He said, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's what Jesus said. Faith alone in Christ alone. It's the only way. Jesus also said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I am the same bringeth forth much fruit. That's John 15. And you know, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. In John 10, verse number 36, he said, Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sin in the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. The only way to heaven is Jesus Christ. It's not through religion. Religion, there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with religion. The Bible even talks about tr pure religion, true religion, undefiled, visiting the fathers and the widows in their affliction, and keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. Religion in and of itself is not necessarily wrong. It can be a good thing. But religion won't get anybody to heaven. Right. It's only a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not through religion. It's not through righteous deeds. It's only through a restored relationship with God through Jesus. And we can all have that, but we have to be willing to humbly approach the Word of God and understand what is the way to heaven. How can I make sure I'm on that way to heaven? Jesus is the way. He's the only way. Again, why is that? It's because of our sin. Our sin has separated us from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Our sin has broken our fellowship with God, and there's nothing that we can do on our own to mend that breach. Jesus is the only way to heaven because our sins have separated us from him. Listen, if you're here this morning, and there's not been a time and place that you've personally put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, call on him and ask him to forgive you and save you, it doesn't matter how religious you are or how good you are, sin will keep you from heaven. Even just one evil thought will keep you from eternal life. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our sin separates us from God, and it is the single reason why Jesus Christ had to die on the cross and rise from the dead. It was to take the penalty for your sins and for mine. And the only way that we can have eternal life is acknowledging our own sinfulness and accepting the gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus paid for on the cross. He came to be your and my substitute. There's a Bible word for that. He came to be a, the propitiation. He came to pay the penalty for our sins, to be the substitute for you and for me. The Bible says in Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Over and over again, you see, the theme of why we're separated from God is sin. I recently met a young, young man, I say young man, he was probably about my age. I consider myself young still, thankfully. Um, I met a, a man in Florida, and um, he was sharing with me how 
He'd been in a motorcycle accident prior to that. He'd never really had much of a relationship with God. Didn't really care much about God. Wasn't interested in God. In fact, the way he described himself was a mean person. He said, I would try to do things to hurt people. He said, but after this motorcycle accident that I was in, he said, the doctor that worked on me, um, he said, the doctor came to me and he said, you know, I never really believed much in God before this. Never really had much interest in God before this. He said, but you know, there's no reason you ought to be alive. He said, and they would known that other people, there have been some people praying for him. And he said, as far as I'm concerned, he said, here's a Bible. I bought one for you. I bought one for me. We're going to figure this thing out. There's, there must be a God. Because of what had happened in the young man's life. And so from that point on, that young man believed in God. But though he believed in God, and he would even talk about the God that saved him, no one had clearly presented to him forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And can a person believe in God and be religious? Now, he wasn't really a religious man yet. He still didn't go to church. But from that point on, for, for a period of probably two years, he had studied the Bible some, clearly believed in God, but no one had clearly explained to him that in order to be saved from our sins, there has to be a time to put our faith in Christ. He'd been saved physically from a car accident that, or from a motorcycle accident that should have killed him. And so he recognized that God had saved his physical body from death. But he had not yet put his faith in God for forgiveness of his sins and eternal life. You know, there are people that they, they say, well, yeah, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven because I should have died once and, and I didn't die. I lived and so I'm saved. And it's a nice thing if, if our life is spared from death. But physical salvation from death is not the same thing as forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And there are unfortunately people that they have their lives spared in a miraculous way. And yet they never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life. And the only way you can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. So the person who has this miraculous death-defying um, experience, what's he still going to do later? He's still going to physically die. But spiritual death is the biggest deal. And the Bible describes that in Revelation 21, 8, where it says, the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, and whoremongers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I may not have gotten all the words just perfect in that verse, but I do know that the latter part there says, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What's the second death that's even worse than the first? The first is just separation of this spirit, this soul from the body. But the second death is eternal separation from God in torments. The Bible describes that clearly. And so the wages of our sin is death. Physical salvation from an from a accident is a wonderful thing. But there has to be a time that we get saved from our sins so that we do not have to take the penalty, which is separation from God forever. That's why Romans 6.23 doesn't end there. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I just encourage you this morning and remind you that eternal life is a gift. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You don't have to be good enough to get it. You just have to accept it. The gift of God is eternal life, and it's only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Imagine this way someone gave this illustration. Imagine a building that's burning. It's on fire. And you see the fire department coming up, and they've got a ladder up to the window. They understand there's a man inside that room, and they're trying to rescue that man from the burning fire there that he's in. And so as the firefighter comes up to the window, he taps on the window, and, and uh, he, um, he, he breaks through the window to get in there. And the man is inside. He's scared. And the man says, look, look I, I'm afraid of heights. I, I don't, can, can, we, can we go down the stairs at the end of the hall? And the firefighter says, no, that way is blocked. We can't go that way. And he says, uh, can, we, can, we go, can we go the fire escape at the end of the building? No, that, that's blocked. We can't get over there. And the firefighter says, look, I am the only way. If you want to be saved, you have to come through me. I'm the only way. Come to me and you'll have safety. Amen. And that's what Jesus is saying to all of us. I'm the only way. Come to me. And you can have safety. You can have eternal life. Well, we can want and try and try to figure out other ways, but Jesus is the only way. But you can have safety and eternal life if you'll come to him. And so Jesus is the way. He is the only way. 
You know, he's the only way to cleansing. 1 John 1, 7, he says, The blood of Jesus Christ's Son cleanseth us from all sin. Some people say, well, I've just done too many bad things. God can't save me. You know, the wonderful thing is, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for every sin of every man that ever would be committed, past, present, and future. And there's nothing that you did that he didn't die for. Not a single sin. And so, he is the way to cleansing. He's the only way to the Father. He said it in our text verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the only way to heaven. 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 says, Blessed be God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What we're here to celebrate today, the Easter resurrection, it was through that resurrection that we were begotten to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that faith not away reserved in heaven for you. Amen. Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's the only way to peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Do you have peace? I'm going to tell you, we live in a world and, and, and in a country right now that we've got a decent bit of turmoil. And we have had for a couple of years now. And you know what? There are a lot of people trying to give the, the answer here and the answer there. And if we would just do this, and if we would just elect this person, or if we just had this reform, then, then we would have peace. But the fact is, if you want peace, you want the peace of God. And the only way you can get the peace of God is through Jesus Christ. But he is the way to peace. He's also the way to victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven, and he's the only way to heaven at great cost. You know, Romans 5, 8 says, But God committed his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This whole week, we celebrate Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday. We celebrate the Passion Week. But it all revolves around the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus came to die and to rise again from the dead. And he did that while we were still in our sins. He said, well, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, the problem oftentimes was, the thing that keeps some people from getting saved, you know what it is? They just don't feel like they're that bad of a person. Well, I know a lot of people that are worse than me. I'm a pretty good person. I'll probably get to heaven. I'll probably do all right. We have to understand that our sin separates us from God. The wages of sin is death. One sin is all it takes to make you a sinner. One murder is all it takes to make a man a murderer. One theft is all it takes to make a man a thief. And all it takes to make you and me a sinner and separated from God is one sin. God's not going to allow one sin in heaven. And no matter how good or moral or, or upright you may seem to be in your own mind compared to others, before God our sin separates us from Him. And the only way we can be reconciled is Jesus Christ's substitutionary death on the cross for your sins and for mine. He took our penalty. He is the way, He is the only way, and He's the only way at great cost. He came without having ever sinned, never having done anything wrong, and they, they plaited a crown of thorns on His head and beat it onto his head with a rod. They whipped him with that cat of nine tails over and over again till his body was bloody and he was unrecognizable. And then they nailed him to that cross and dropped that cross into the hole. And you know, it's an interesting thing too. There's no reason why Jesus should have died on the cross other than the fact that the Old Testament had prophesied that he was not going to have any bones broken and, and that Jesus himself had prophesied that he was going to die on the cross. It didn't make any sense. Jews killed by stoning. Why did he die on the cross? That's not how the Jews did things. He died on the cross because he said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men to myself. He died on the cross because that was God's plan and will for him. He died on the cross because he was going to suffer the ultimate pain and shame so that our sins could be forgiven. He, was, he is the only way at great cost. He not only went through all that physical pain, but you have to understand what was more to Jesus than the physical pain that he went through. He, he willingly chose to allow himself to die. But what, he, what was worse for him was when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, lama sabachthani, however you want to pronounce it when he was saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
When his own father in heaven, the only time he referred to him as my God instead of my father, when his father turned his back on him. Why? Because the sins of yourself and myself and all of mankind for all of time were placed on him and God had to look away. Greater than the physical pain that Jesus went through was recognizing that his own God, his own father, had turned his back on him as he bore the sin of mankind. He's the only way at great cost. And so I, I ask you, do you think that if he's the only way he went through all of that, if you reject him and you say, I'm going to go my own way, how do you think God is going to respond to that? You say, I'm not going to go the way that God has provided through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go the way, Lord Jesus, that you offer, which is just faith in you alone and forgiveness of sins. I'm going to find my own way. Well, ultimately, if you reject the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ, then God will not make you have it. That gift is an offer made by Christ, paid for at great cost, and if you reject it, then ultimately the only offer left for you is eternal separation from God and the lake of fire. Stepping over the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his gift of forgiveness. And so uh, he was the only way at great cost. One, another illustration that's been given about that just kind of illustrates this well, the great cost and what it was like. There was uh, an illustration of a man who operated a drawbridge and uh, daily he would make the drawbridge grow up as ships would pass underneath the bridge. And then daily he would put the bridge down as trains would pass over the bridge. And one day, this man who uh, had a, a young son of, of his older age that he loved very dearly, he brought his son with him to work to show him the operations of this drawbridge. He brought him with him to show him uh, how, how it worked and all the things that he did. And this was a job he'd worked for many years. And as he brought this young man with him to show him, his son, to show him uh, all of the operations of the bridge, he brought him into the, the area there where he would operate the bridge and make the bridge go up and as the ship went under and then as the bridge was going up and as the, the ships were preparing to come under, he took his son over and he showed him outside of, uh, all of the, the big gears as they would operate and move that bridge and walked across the catwalk there showing them all the things that were taking place uh, and this was part of the job that he did and, and uh, as he was going about showing his son this job that he'd done and his son accidentally slipped off of the catwalk down into the large mechanisms that were operating the drawbridge. And the father recognized quickly that there was not going to be any way for him both to get down and bring his son to safety and get back to operate the drawbridge to move it back down before the train that was quickly approaching was going to make it to the drawbridge. And so with great agony, the father went back into the area where he had to operate that that drawbridge control and he went ahead and activated the lever that was going to make the drawbridge come down recognizing that by saving the lives of all those that were on that train that day he was having to sacrifice the son that he loved who was not going to be able to live down in the gears as they were moving to operate the drawbridge now that illustration of father having to make that decision to save all of those people on the train and sacrifice his son whom he loved just gives us a little bit of a picture of what it would be like and what it is like what it was like for god to recognize that you and i could not be saved if there were not some way made jesus was going to be the only way his sacrifice was going to be required the only way that we could have reconciliation to god was through jesus christ coming and dying on the cross and so god willingly offered his son jesus to make it possible for us to have forgiveness and eternal life. Now, the wonderful and encouraging part about it all is, though, Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. You know, it's an encouraging thing because Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, uh, endured the cross, despised, and the shame. What was the joy that was set before the Lord Jesus Christ? It was the salvation of your soul and mine if we put our faith in him. And it was the joy of knowing that he wasn't going to stay dead, but he was going to rise again the third day. You know, it talks about Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 describes the death of the Messiah that's to come very clearly. It very clearly describes how Jesus was going to die. And later on in the passage of Isaiah 53, it talks about how he's going to divide the spoil of the strong. What's that talking about? That's talking about after Jesus' resurrection, how God was going to reward him. As soon as Jesus rose from the dead, 40 days later, he ascended and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. So he went through all that for you and for me to have our sins forgiven, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, purchasing for you and me the opportunity for eternal life and also purchasing for himself the glory of sitting at the right hand of his Father and being exalted throughout all of eternity. Now, 
All of that brings me to a few points for you to kind of draw to conclusion. If Jesus is the way, and if he's the only way, and if he's the only way at great cost, then you need to go that way. Go the way that is Jesus Christ. Don't try any other way. There is no other way. Go that way. Romans 10, 9, and 10, and verse number 13 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, I told you about that young man that I was talking to recently who had gotten into a motorcycle accident and he started to believe in God, but nobody had shared with him about how he needed to have his sins forgiven and needed to accept Jesus Christ as the forgiveness of his sins and eternal life. And so as I began to share that with him, he was ready and open and willing to that very day pray and accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. Because as soon as he understood that the way to eternal salvation and forgiveness of sins, then he could put his faith in Jesus Christ alone. You know, sometimes you say, well, I just don't understand all about all that. So, so you're saying that it's not through baptism. Well, what way is it then? Well, you're saying it's not good works. Well, what way is it then? Well, you're saying, well, it's not church membership. It's not that, well, how is it? Well, it's faith in Jesus Christ. Well, what do you mean faith in Jesus Christ? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what does salvation look like when the rubber beats the road for even a Thomas who was religious but didn't know the way, didn't know where Jesus was going? Maybe you say, well, I, I've tried all the things. I just don't understand. It's just simply calling on the Lord Jesus Christ and receiving him alone, his forgiveness of sins and eternal life that he offers. God didn't make salvation difficult. Jesus did the difficult work on the cross. God made salvation easy for you and me. All that we have to do is accept it by faith. Call on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul and Silas said when they were asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus said, Except men be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know what that picture is? It's a picture of a spiritual birth. A time and place that we're born spiritually. There's a time and place that each one of us was born physically. Probably you don't remember that. You were probably pretty little then. But you know, you can remember, and in fact, you ought to remember the time and place if you've been born spiritually. Because spiritual birth comes at the moment you choose to accept, by faith, Jesus Christ's gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. Where you call on him and say, Lord Jesus, I understand I'm a sinner that my sin has separated me from God, and that you came to die for me, and I want to accept your gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. Please forgive me and save me. That's what biblical salvation looks like. You know, that's essentially what the question that the young man asked me when I was talking to him that day. He was like, well, well, how is it that you, what do you do then? We just pray and ask the Lord to forgive you and save you and accept that gift. That's biblical salvation. So my, my challenge for you is, if he's the way and he's the only way, he's the only way at great cost, then go that way. Go through Jesus Christ. He's the only way. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. You want to be a son of God? You can be. You have to receive him by believing on his name. Put your faith in Jesus Christ alone today and be saved. So number one, go the way. If you haven't before, if you can't think of a time and place that you personally have called the Lord and asked Him to forgive you and save you, I'm not talking about something you do daily. I'm not talking about confirmation or baptism or church membership. I'm talking about a time and place that you personally called out on the Lord by faith, asking Him to forgive you and save you of your sins and give you eternal life. If you can't remember a time and place like that, then you ought to go that way today. Be born again. Spiritual birth. But number two, Many of you already have gone that way. My second challenge is know the way. You say know the way, what do you mean? You have to know the way before you can go the way. Well, sort of. But Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Jesus is the way, and I challenge you to get to know him. There are a lot of people that say, yeah, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I'm on my way to heaven, but you know what? They don't, they don't really act like they know the way very well. Because their life doesn't reflect knowing Jesus Christ. 
Man, I talk to a number of people, and when they find out I'm a preacher, they're like, oh yeah, I've done this ministry over here, and I went over here, and I did that thing over there, and they talk about, I just heard them cussing a second ago, but they found out I was a preacher, so now they're telling me about how good they are. That's fine, I'm not, they're not my enemy. But sometimes there's a significant dichotomy between what we claim and what we actually live a lot of the time. God has called us as Christians to get to know Him and His Word. And so I challenge you, know the way. Get to know Jesus Christ through His Word. You know, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Biblical Christianity, it's, it's not really popular as Christianity. Biblical Christianity is not always easy. Jesus said, if they, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. And so, we've been called to know him. There are many people that claim to know him, but they don't go to his house very often. The church. They take his name in vain. Don't talk to him very often. Live life as if he doesn't even exist. But then if anybody talks to him that's religious, yeah, I, I know God. I know Jesus. Well, I challenge you. Go the way, accept that gift of salvation, and then continue to get to know God better. You know what? None of us are perfect. We aren't. I'm not. You spend any time with me, you'll understand that. Not just in theory, but in actual fact. None of us are perfect. That's why there's a biblical word for that. It's called sanctification, where God continually makes us more and more like Him. Thankfully, I'm not the one who has to save myself from my sin. Jesus did that when he died on the cross. I'm not the one who has to keep myself saved. Jesus did a good enough job on the cross that he died for all the sins I ever would commit, ever did commit, and he can keep me saved regardless of anything I do. Thankfully, if I had to keep myself saved, I just couldn't do it, and neither could you. Jesus saves us. Jesus keeps us saved. But he does want to do that sanctifying work in our lives, making us more like him. And the only way that's going to happen is by spending time in His Word. John, uh, Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You get into the Word of God, and you let the Word of God make you more like Christ. You get to know Jesus Christ more. Paul says, I may know Him in the power of His resurrection. Again, we're celebrating Easter today, the resurrection of Christ. And you know that same power is the power that's available to us. In fact, in Ephesians chapter number 6, um, Paul says, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. God offers to you and to me the power that was the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead can help you and me to live victorious Christian lives. And that's what God wants for you and me. You know, we all struggle sometimes. We do. We struggle with the flesh. We struggle with temptation. We struggle with the world. But we can have victory. And the power that's available to us is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That power, that miraculous power, that unexplainable power, the very power of God, he says, be strong in that power. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So number one, go the way. Number two, know the way. And as you know the way, I kind of referenced this a little bit earlier, but John 15, you know what Jesus said? I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch of me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch he beareth fruit, he purges it that it bring forth more fruit. Now you're clean to the word which I have spoken of you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye accept you abide in me. Do you know what Jesus is describing through all of this passage? He's saying, get to know me. Abide in me. Walk with me. He says in another, another passage, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So God wants us to get to know him well. God doesn't save us just to keep us out of hell. He wants to keep us out of hell. Listen, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ only to keep you from hell, that's a good enough reason. Don't go to hell. God doesn't want you to. Put your faith in Jesus Christ alone. But God does not want to save you just to keep you out of hell. He wants to save you to have a real and personal relationship with him every day of this life and throughout all of eternity. That's what God wants. He wants to have a real and personal relationship with you. Where you spend time in his word and you get to know him and you talk to him in prayer and you cast your cares upon him and you pray because he cares about you. That's what God wants for you. And so he says, abide in me. And if you'll abide in me and I abide in you, he says, you'll bear much fruit. He says, I'm the vine, you the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We have a lot of Christians in American Christianity today that aren't very fruitful. I'm going to tell you the biggest reason is because we don't abide in Christ. Because if we're abiding in Christ, we will bear much fruit. That's what Jesus said. You have to argue with him. You abide in Christ, you will bear much fruit. 
So if we're not bearing much fruit, then we need to abide in Christ more. He says, if a man abide not in me, is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and then gather them, and cast them in the fire, and they're burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. You need to bear fruit. Glorify God. Show you're a disciple of Christ. You'll bear fruit as you abide in Him. Now, I will say this too. Sometimes we may bear fruit that we don't even see. You sow the seed of the gospel often enough, far enough, long enough, and there may be some fruit that's going to be bear, born that you'll never see. But be faithful. All right, number one, go the way. Number two, know the way. And lastly, show the way. You can show others the way to heaven. And that's a responsibility, a privilege, and opportunity that we all have. Jesus came and died and rose from the dead. All of that that he did in the Passion Week, all of his life culminated in that death, burial, and ultimately the resurrection on that third day. All of it culminated. In, why did Jesus do all of that? Why do we come together every Sunday as a resurrection day? Why do we come together on Easter, especially remembering that resurrection? Why did he do all those things? He did it for one reason. It was to save people from their sins, to offer them the gift of eternal life. And if you have already received that, then God didn't take you to heaven yet because he wants you to share that with others. He wants you to show others the way. Are you sharing Christ with others? Are you doing that on a regular basis, on a daily basis? Are you sharing the way with others? What a sad thing for a person to know the way to heaven. To be on the way to heaven and to not share the way to heaven with others. It would be like me having the cure to cancer and I had cancer and I got that cure and now I don't have cancer anymore but I keep quiet about it and don't share it with other people that have cancer well that would be wrong it would be unloving it would be unkind and if we love others and perfect love casteth out all fear we're going to be willing to share the way to heaven with others I challenge you share show the way to others how can you do it? Well, there's lots of ways you can do that. You can pick up some gospel tracts. We went out yesterday and passed out a whole bunch of gospel tracts. That's one way. It's a good way. You ought to do it. By the way, you know you'll never pass out a gospel tract you don't have with you. It won't happen. So you ought to get some. Put them in your purse. Put them in your pocket. Put them in your car. Put them somewhere. Have some gospel tracts with you because you can't pass them out if you don't have them. Find out what pastor's got them and make him buy more. Just gave them all out. Right, and that ought to be, you know what, I, I would love, it would be a wonderful thing if the church ran into financial difficulties because they were spending so much on gospel literature. Right. Now, I don't think that's ever going to happen because if you're getting out that much gospel literature, then the church is going to be busting at the seams as people are going to be, there's going to be fruit in the seed of summer. I'm just going to say that. God promised it. He would say, so sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he would so bountifully shall reap also bountifully. You get the gospel seed out, it's going to make a difference. So take gospel tracts, but you know what? Far more than that, in your community, in your workplace, in your home, with those that you know, share the gospel. Show the way. Find opportunities, make opportunities to share the gospel. People are dying and going to hell because Christians are not sharing the gospel. We have less, Christ we have less people getting saved in this day than we did in other days because the gospel is being shared less in this day than it was in other days. We could try to blame it on the economy or try to blame it on the world in which we live. We could try to blame it on all the things, but the truth is, the root issue of all of the things that we're running into are because we are not sharing the gospel like we should. Because we're not walking with Christ like we should. And as we do what we're supposed to do, God will honor his word and use it for his glory and for our good. And so I challenge you and encourage you to show the way. Are you sharing Christ with others on a daily basis? Imagine a person... I mean, they put a lot of time, effort, work, money into preparing a gift. And they prepare that gift for you because they love you. And so they at great personal cost and expense to themselves, work hard making and preparing, purchasing materials to make this gift. And they prepare this gift. And as they prepare this gift for you, after all the time, effort, money spent and sacrifice that they put into it, they offer that gift to you. And you're like, oh, thanks, but I don't really want that. That's not the kind of gift I like. That's not the kind of gift that I want. Some people do that with the gift of eternal life. God offered at great cost his own son as the only way. So we would have to do nothing for eternal life except accept the gift. And some people are like, yeah, that's not the way I want to go. I'll, I'll pick my way, thanks. 
I'll just try to be a good enough person to see how it works. And I'm going to tell you what, when a person has put a lot of time, effort, money, expense, and sacrifice into providing a gift, and that gift is spurned or scorned, then does it surprise you that the God of heaven who offers only one way, when you say no that way, then the God of heaven says no to you. But some people say, well, all right, I'll accept the gift. But then they stick it on the shelf. They let it get dusty. They treat it like it's not of very much value. It doesn't mean much to them. And many of us that have already received the gift of eternal life, we treat that gift of eternal life that we've received like, uh, you know, I'm glad I got it. But we're not showing it off to others. We're not sharing it with others. We just got it up on the shelf. And again, how do you think the one that prepared that gift, that great cost to himself, that great sacrifice to himself, when he sees us just treating it like it's not that big of a deal, not that valuable, how do you think he feels? You know, one day, the very one that died on the cross and rose from the dead, we're all going to stand before him. And if we're Christians, we're going to stand before him and give an account of what we did for him in this life. You know what we get today to do something for him, to prepare for that day, to lay up gold, silver, and precious stone, not just wood, hay, and stubble that will be consumed. We get today, and we get what time we have left in our lives to make a difference for eternity. Jesus said not to lay up treasures on earth, but to lay up treasures in heaven. How do you do that? You've got to do something that matters for eternity. What are you doing that's mattering for eternity? Are you showing the way of salvation to others? Are you showing the way to heaven to others? There's only one way. Jesus is the way. He's the only way, and he's the way at great cost. You need to go that way. You need to know that way. Get to know more. You need to show that way to others. I really believe this. As we come for this morning, Easter morning, celebrating the resurrection, I think the Lord would be pleased if we got a hold of the whole purpose why he came, died, and rose from the dead, and it made a difference in our lives this morning. I think he would be pleased by that. And so I challenge you, if you've not been saved, you've not gone that way yet, that's why he came. That's why he rose from the dead, so that you could go through him. If you've already gone that way, he wants you to get to know him better. He wants me to get to know him better. And he wants us to show the way to heaven.